Hi, thanks for meeting with us this morning. Um, this morning we're going to be talking about who is AIR, um, better known as American Institute for Research. And I've invited Allison Cook and Autumn. Nope. I'm sorry, I mixed it up. <laughs> <laughs> Allison Williams. Williams and Autumn Cook to come and meet with us, uh, with myself, Elisa Ellis, and talk a little bit more about this. So I'm Autumn. Um, that's Autumn, and I'm Allison. Okay. <laughs> Hold on one second. I still have Autumn's screen um, folded. So, Autumn, why don't you go ahead and give us a basic overview of who is AIR? AIR is the organization that the Utah State Office of, Organ of Education has contracted with to write the assessments that our kids will be taking under the new Common Core um, standards. And so they're... Um, they're a long-standing organization that's focused a lot actually on behavioral research, which has obviously raised concern among those of us who feel that our kids' education ought to be about academic knowledge and skills. And, um, and so we're very interested to see how these assessments in Utah are going to um, form, what they're going to look like coming from an organization that has a history of, of doing behavioral research and um, work in, in changing and influencing behavior. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, Allison, do you have anything to add to that? Um, just that um, a little background. When Utah signed on to the Common Core, we also signed on to an assessment consortium called the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium. And um, after reviewing the uh, commitments that that document obligated us to with the federal government, um, the governor and eventually the state board were convinced to uh, withdraw from that assessments consortium. And so then we had to contract directly with uh, someone who would conduct the assessments for Utah. And American Institutes of Research is who we chose. And those of us who were following it were very disappointed to learn that um, American Institutes of Research is the very group that um, the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium, or SBAC, has also contracted to administer the test. So we feel like we um, ended up with the same test Choice. anyway. Yes. Um, so yesterday I saw an article, um, and I haven't had the chance to read it, but the headline appeared as if... Um, P-A-R-C-C, -C, or PARC, I don't know what it stands for, but it's the other testing consortium, that they also are using AIR. Did I, is that what the article said? Did either of you get to read that? I didn't see that one. I read the article. I don't know that it said that PARC is using AIR. Okay. Um, I, I don't know, I don't think it said that. It okay. simply that was just what I gathered from the headline, so that's what no, I want to clear up. No, what, it, what, it, what is happening is that the two consortia, the SBAC and the PARC um, are going to be going undergoing a, a federal review process. So we've been told the federal government has nothing to do with this. But if the federal government is going to be reviewing the uh, assessments and, and activities of these two consortia, you can be sure they're going to be giving them direction on what they're supposed to do. And so it was a really amazingly fast jump from there's no federal involvement to now the federal government is overseeing the consortia to which 45 U.S. states belong. Yeah. The fact that the uh, two consortia were both um, funded or were recipients of Race to the Top assessment grants from the federal government, you know, people assumed that the federal government would have some oversight, you know, in spite of the fact that it just became official with that announcement yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I, you know, that wasn't news to me that they would be overseeing it because if you read the cooperative agreement, which, um, you know, we found when we were doing research into um, the race to the top for assessments and trying to figure out how Utah joined Common Core and what avenue we took to get there, um, the cooperative agreement very clearly states that they will be working together with the, the other consortium and with the Department of Ed. Um, so. The, the real glaring, um, the second glaring issue that came from that article about the federal review process was that uh, two of the members of the new committee, that's going to be a seven-member uh, 
I think it's a seven-member panel, review panel, that this federal government's putting together. Two of those members are actually from the consortia. One is from PARC and one is from SBAC. <laughs> so <laughs> how, um, mm, how corrupt is that? They're reviewing them. They consult with the consortia and then they get to validate their own work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So interesting. <laughs> Which so maybe the, shows how much the federal government trusts exactly what SBAC and PARC are doing. Yeah. So the reason we're bringing this up in, today in the first place is because beginning next week, um, the State Office of Education is hosting um, show and tell, if you will, um, going around the state and showing um, different districts and citizens the new testing um, plans and I don't know exactly what will be entailed in that presentation. Um, anyway, so that's why we're bringing it up because as, as parents find out about this and attend the meeting and I haven't gotten one notification from anybody. The only reason I know about the, these um, presentations is because I'm involved heavily in trying to understand what's going on. So I, I and you, you two ladies also feel a responsibility to let other citizens know that these are even happening and what kind of questions parents should ask when going. So, um, And encourage Allison, parents to go. Help them yes, realize please. that these, the nature of these tests really requires them to be involved if they care about what's going on in their, edu their kids' education. Yeah, and um, a friend of mine, Renee, she's in a lot of the videos with us, um, she always says that silence does not necessarily mean acceptance. But that's what our elected officials interpret silence as because there aren't very many people that are willing to stand up and speak out. And so we need to we need to let our voices be heard. It's not causing contention, it's raising awareness and it is um, just making sure that we're part of the process. So. It's really hard to stand up and speak out when you don't know that yes. these meetings are happening and That's true. even though they organize the meetings and have them open to the public um, I don't know that I would have found out about the meetings had I not raised some concerns to a school board member about the test who told me that these meetings were going to happen. And then I, I directly contacted someone at the State Office of Education and she sent me the schedule. And then I shared it with the principal of my kid's school because I thought, um, oh, I was just asking her if it could be in the school newsletter so that other parents would know mm -hmm. about it. And uh, she hadn't heard from the, either the school district or the state um, office of education about these meetings. So I, I don't know how well they're being publicized, but um, I hope that a lot of parents from my area will go and learn more about these um, assessments. And, and I think I'd like to point out that the whole fact that they have not publicized it well is frustrating for those of us who've watched the workings of the USOA and feel like they don't um, care to reach out to those whose input they don't want um, because um, it's basically they can now say we held meetings all over the state where parents were invited to review and either nobody came or we had a few and and there wasn't really an influence and uh, and so they get to claim they held these meetings without really informing the people who would be directing this if they knew um, and w when I think about um, the fact that they're holding the the air review meeting in the Alpine School District, the biggest district in the state, on spring break week, that just doesn't seem um, like you're really encouraging the involvement of the public. So that's happening this week. So I said Tomorrow. a minute ago, I didn't realize that. I was thinking we they started next week. Oh wait, they've okay. already been held in some school districts. Wow. Okay, I just made a false accusation. I have to repent. Um, it is. It's next Thursday. I was thinking tomorrow. It's next Thursday. I'm okay, sorry. and ours is next week also. I hope yeah. I didn't schedule anything else on top. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what are some of the questions to help parents come equipped to these meetings to know what kind of questions to ask? Because um, you go and you ask a question and you say. Um, who's going to be writing the test? And they say, I, you know, we will, parents will. Is that, you know, are there any follow up questions to a question like that, Allison? Um, well, just, I think a little background. This is a, a change between the types of computer based tests that we've had before 
um, that were called, I think, criterion reference test, mm -hmm. and these are called computer adaptive tests. So computer adaptive test is where um, no student, no two students will maybe see the same test. The tests are kind of built on the fly as students answer questions, and they're adjusted to the level of the student. Um, so one of the questions I have that I don't completely understand about computer adaptive tests is if the tests are adjusted to meet the level of the student, how can you compare apples to apples of students on what they understand about the content knowledge? And I'm sure that testing experts could explain that a little bit better than I understand. Um, another question that I have is um, one uh, article that I read, the um, expert said that on a typical, uh, on a regular type of test, there's maybe 200 questions that have to be written for that test. On a computer adaptive test for each um, grade level or um, level, there can be upwards of 1,600 questions wow. um, in the pool to make it an accurate computer adaptive test so that they can have lots of different options um, to build these tests on the fly. Well, that's a lot of, of test questions. Mm -hmm. And um, when we say in Utah that we are, uh, no one's told me that we are going to write the questions per se. <laughs> the people that I've asked have said we control the questions. And so that's another thing that I want clarified is um, because the documents that AIR has already posted on the USOE website um, says they say that there's going to be um, a pool of questions that include questions created by and for other states, I'm assuming for these other consortia that we already talked about. And there are uh, multiple um, agencies working to create these questions. If you read the press release um, for the partnership between the SBAC and the AIR, it mentions a number of other agencies who also say that they're involved in creating the questions. So I don't think it's as easy as it sounds to write yeah. and vet these questions. Yeah. Um, Allison, one point that you brought up was that these tests will be different than what we previously had used. Now, I have been told, and I don't have the research to back this up, that Utah already was using an adaptive testing program that was put into law um, in a previous session before we had Common Core. So that's just something to look into. Um, these would be different because it's geared towards Common Core state standards, um, but I, I don't my know if those were statewide or, I mean, I know there well, were I know some they pilot, did pilot programs. Yeah, I know that also. But just a teacher in my local valley wanted us to come in and look at the adaptive testing. So, and that she's a science teacher. So, anyways, so just some, you know, a point, just in case, so we don't throw yeah. out wrong information. I don't know which way is right. Take we just me. need to look into that. So, <laughs> anyway, um, okay. So, what other kind of questions? Okay, so you said a pool of question, and also that they air said that that citizens would be having input in some of the questions. So Not I think citizens. I'm... AIR said that teachers would be teachers. able to okay. um, contribute to the questions. Um, and that, I think that was in the section talking about the formative assessments. Okay. Well, what I would, another question to ask would be, you know, who will be creating these questions? Um, and if they're drawing from a pool of questions, what percentage would be coming from Utah's creations versus this pool of questions? Because they can throw one question in and say Utah has had a hand in creating questions, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But, you know, and yeah. maybe students would never even see those questions based on based on the aspect of the adaptive yeah. testing. So, right. So well, maybe we can talk about why we're concerned. Yes. <laughs> about who gets to write. The questions. Yes. Go ahead. Um, you, you take that away. <laughs> the reason that I'm concerned for I, one reason is that um, because it's a computer adaptive test, 
as a parent, I will never get to see the test or what questions my um, child is asked on this test. And um, because of another thing, this past legislative session, um, there was a, a Senate bill that came up, and I don't know if it made it. I, I don't think it made it out of committee, but it was it was uh, making adjustments to some of the rules that govern assessments in Utah, and um, it specifically mentioned um, that the use of behavioral indicators would be applied in these assessments. Um, so. Because we, because of the background of AIR as a, a company staffed largely by psychologists, mm -hmm. and their work to assess behavior and social adjustment and these types of things, I had a concern that these weren't um, academic only tests. That, um, but no one at the uh, state. School Office of Education has been able, to, and maybe I just haven't talked to the right person yet, but they haven't been able to explain to me why that behavioral indicators was included in that bill. Yeah. Well, um, Crystal wrote in her blog, and she was going to join us today, but what, but couldn't be here. That she was given a response that at least 15 Utah parents would be helping with the the quest. quest. Yeah, that. That actually was in that same bill that this panel of 15 parents would be set up to review um, all of the test questions. Um, but like I said, 1,600 questions at least per grade, if I'm understanding this correctly, and this is something that I would ask to have clarified at these meetings. How do 15 parents review that many questions for K through? 12 essentially uh, for these tests 19,000 questions and how would they uh, who you know who, who is an expert in how these behavioral indicators are weaved into the tests and what those show and <laughs> yeah and here I could add a little bit um, when you realize that there's been effort over the last about 40 years to use psychological techniques in the education system, it's helpful to understand how those have been used. So you say, well, okay, they care about behavior, I care about behavior too. Well, they're talking about, um, once again, not the academic skills, but the um, belief systems of kids. Um, how do you behave in response to certain situations? And it's, um, <clears throat> so, so what they'll do is they'll take this assessment and they'll figure out where a kid stands um, on his beliefs based on a few pointed questions. And then they will get the aggregate of the responses from kids in a school, a certain grade or certain class. And then they will actually recommend curriculum based on the responses to help guide, direct, and alter the belief system, the way of thinking, the uh, comfort level with certain situations or ideas in that class, that school, that area. Um, and that has been documented um, for at least at least 25 years, um, perhaps more, that, that there's been efforts to do that. And this is an amazing culmination of those efforts. And most people don't seem aware of, of what it implies. Most people think of education, they think they're having an assessment, they're assessing whether they know their math skills, their reading skills, whether they know what the scientific method is, etc. But this is designed to do something different. Yeah, Allison, do you um, can you loosely quote um, the John Goodlad quote that's in the chart you created? Um, John Goodlad is an education reformer who is into this social um, moving of the kids. As I don't know the right terminology right there, but that Autumn is mentioning. And can you? So he asked two I, questions. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Yeah, I think it's the one where he says the most important uh, questions um, of this half of the century will not be what information or what knowledge is of most worth, but what kind of people we want to create. And he, he had a philosophy that the second was the more important yeah. question that um, 
that we need to use education yeah. to, for, you know, guide what kind of people we want in our society. And that doesn't which, sound so bad with my religious beliefs, but that's the point is that those are my religious beliefs and how I feel that my children should be run and I don't want an outside entity who doesn't hold my same values and beliefs using that same philosophy to try to create the type of human they want to create because my values don't match up with um, a lot of the worldly values that we see. Yeah, most parents we want to create individuals, independent Yes people who can think for themselves and, and make good choices and um, but it, it's still kind of founded in their individual agency I would say mm -hmm. at least as a yes. mother I um, I want to create an environment where they grow to be strong healthy independent people mm -hmm. but um, I I'm not raising and rearing children to serve the needs of the collective to um, be a cog in the wheel of uh, a managed economy or meet certain um, to fit into certain social norms um, I would hope actually that my kids would be able to stand independent of certain social norms. That's true. So. I just was thinking there's <laughs> values that I hold and I hope that they grow up with those values. You know, yeah. that's not but that, I, I think that's that's a good point. People hear that quote and say oh yeah of course. I mean any kind of education is you know, influencing someone one way or the other. I think that um, you just have to consider what is what knowledge is of most worth to each individual, as of as opposed to what knowledge is of most worth into shaping this person <laughs> to yeah. be a certain way. Yeah, and I have seven children, and you guys have, you know, children, and I'm sure that you recognize, as I have, that they are so uniquely different each one of them. I mean it is amazing especially as um, now I'm having teenagers and things in their their personalities came out as babies but it's even more so as they're um, starting to really stand on their own feet and become their own person. So I think it's fair to say that with AIR we're concerned that these are assessments that that people other than us are using to form the beliefs and the type of person our children are. They're seeing a, a captive audience that they can shape and mold sitting in the classroom. I think that's mm -hmm. tied to the push for longer school days. It's easier to influence a kid who you have captive for 10 hours than one you have captive for six. And um, we just have concerns that that could turn out that way mm -hmm. here in Utah with these air assessments. And so uh, we're looking to make sure it isn't that and to speak up if it is. Yeah. Well, let's give a recap of what type of questions um, should be asked at these meetings. So okay. I'm going well, can in there I and add I something know to what yes, Autumn go ahead. Just, yes, um, I just wanted to add something because it, it matched with what Autumn said. Um, these in in the the slideshow that they've posted online, it talks about how they will do um, formative and summative assessments. And so the formative assessments are kind of like what we would consider a pretest, but they are also a teaching tool. Um, part of the uh, grant application that the consortia put in to get the money from Race to the Top says that they would use some of the money to create model curriculum. And I didn't realize this till I was rereading these um, slides that they posted the other day, but it talks about how they are going to, um, when they give these, when teachers give these formative assessments that um, based on the kids answers they will be directed to specific curriculum that can be put into that system in a number of ways teachers being one of the ways and it's going to replace Utah's UTIPS system that I wasn't terribly familiar with but I asked a little bit about it at my kids school and some of the teachers use it it's a, a you know a computer-based repository for um, curriculum and, and tests like this so uh, another thing that I, I want to ask about in light of the curriculum delivery system in Texas that has been in the news a lot lately, C-Scope, mm -hmm. is also who is developing the curriculum or these lesson plans or whatever they are that are going to be in this system that then will be used as a formative 
um, measure. So basically kind of using testing as Autumn suggested to to teach and realign the teaching for a certain end and whether or not that end is academic or uh, attitudes. <laughs> yeah. And you know one of the things that we forgot to mention before we wrap up is that uh, one of the things that concerns us is that the AIR group that's going to be doing these tests um, is part of the Clinton Global Initiative. Um, anybody who wants to research that can understand why that would raise some of our concerns. Um, but I think people should be aware of that fact. Also, you're, um, with, we don't have um, really clear governance guidelines on um, student level information, especially that is under the control of a third party. And another thing that they specifically mentioned in the slides is how the um, student information starting this fall will be transferred from Utrex into their own um, student database for um, these assessments and for tracking. And so um, what is the governance of that data? How long will it be stored on each student? What type of information do they store? Who can they, who will they share it with? Because um, ever since the federal FERPA laws were relaxed, um, we don't have uh, clear protections on that information, and there's no, uh, there's really no process for a parent to control that. Yeah, and the, and the response of we would never share your child's personal data shouldn't be. Um, a sufficient answer because a promise while well and good these people that are currently sitting in authoritative positions will not always be there so we need to have the proper right. protections in place to make sure that parents have authority over their children's information and data um, and the processes that go into play there so yeah we've seen we've seen it happen already um, with the in bloom project um, information shared without parental consent, student level and very detailed information in the name of education and, and research, but um, you know that was kind of the, the highest profile um, sharing of data that parents were really shocked to find out about. Yeah, and I've interviewed um, over the past couple of days people that have really gotten into research into what data is. So. Um, for any viewers that are viewing this, you can click on the YouTube channel and go watch some other presentations by people that um, will really get into the specifics of these other aspects. Um, one man I interviewed yesterday really talked a lot about the high stakes testing um, and how that affects children and teachers. And then I also yesterday interviewed a woman who um, really delved deep into the data collection and what rights parents have. So. Um, I will post a link of the questions on the top of this video in an edit. Um, so, Autumn, did you have something you wanted to share? No, I'm good. I think that was great. Okay. Um, so, just a recap of some questions. I just think we should close up with just a list of some questions. So, parents should be asking, who is American Institute Research? What is their background? Um, who will be helping to formulate the questions? Um, what percentage of questions will be coming from a, a question pool, if at all? And we just need to make sure we have um, specific sources citing that and documentation to the responses. Um, how we need to ask about the bill, is it SB 69, Allison? Yeah, it was Senate Bill 69. I don't, um, like I said, I don't think that it made it out of committee, but it's still on the website if people want to go and see where okay. they're, what they're trying to state is needed yeah. as far as statute okay. goes. And what type of behavioral, because I do know that um, Utah Futures, which is more job tracking, it's not quite the same thing, but that they mentioned behavior um, indicators in there as well. So it's not an, an unknown entity that they might be looking at behavioral. Um, information. So um, I think that those were all the questions that we had. Um, if I, we, I put in one more, Elisa. Yes, 
go ahead. And that would be, um, what is the purpose of the questions? I don't know that you'd get a straight answer, but it's it would be yes. nice to let them know that you're wondering exactly yes. what they're trying what to is do the with the questions. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, and thank you guys for meeting with us today, and for anyone that's watching. Um, thank you for taking the time to care and let your voice be heard, and please attend these meetings. We'll post um, a link to the, the meetings as well.